Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. This is May 21st, 2020. I am so pleased to be joined tonight by Dr. Elizabeth Marcelino. Dr. Marcelino is a clinical psychologist right here in Cambridge at the Cambridge Health Alliance on Central Street. Dr. Marcelino, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure and thank you so much for asking, truthfully. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. I think this is going to be one of the more important shows that we've been producing virtually, mm -hmm. um, primarily because I think uh, after 10 weeks, I think we're 10 weeks, 11 weeks into uh, the COVID uh, emergency pandemic lockdown. Some people call it a lockdown. Some people yeah. call it other things. But I think all of us, Dr. Marcelino, are starting to feel the effects of mm -hmm. one thing, one primary thing, and that is isolation from the ma vast majority of humans that we've interacted with all of our lives. So I wanted to touch base on a few things, but give you the opportunity first uh, to describe your practice and base how you did things pre-COVID and mm -hmm. what that's done to you during COVID. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm relatively new to the Cambridge Health Alliance, actually. I worked... Um, for about 28 years in a group private practice in Boston, and then I uh, had occasion to go down to Sutherland Springs, Maryland, uh, for the shootings, the mass shootings that took place down there. I was sent for the Red Cross disaster response team. And it was really there in that experience that I got a very different view of what trauma looks like in a community and how immigration status, how poverty level, how skin color, how finances, and all of those things determined who came forward and asked for help, who didn't, and what help even looked like. So it was only about a year or so ago that I joined here, uh, CHA, and I'm a program leader of several different training teams, uh, but one of them in particular is the Victims of Violence team, and I work with the Center for Homicide Bereavement and the Victims Resource Center as well. So what I try to do is to think about trauma a lot from a lot of different perspectives, individually, socially, and now, of course, globally and nationally. So um, for me and the work that I do when I think about this pandemic, the actual medical piece of, you know, who gets sick and who doesn't is obvious and preoccupying and anxiety provoking for many but all the more so, I think, for people that have underlying mental health conditions. And at Cambridge Health Alliance, certainly, we, and I'm guessing really in many, many communities, we see a lot of people who have many challenging things that they've been struggling with before we even got to COVID. Um, they're living paycheck to paycheck, as many Americans are, for example, and struggling with anxiety and depression post-traumatic stress disorder from a variety of different things. And, and in the Cambridge Health Alliance in particular, where we work, it's not only, you know, sexual abuse, it's torture or, you know, um, being a sex slave or all kinds of uh, egregious and horrible things. So when we're seeing those folks and, you know, the ordinary folks um, who have made it through life relatively well, and everybody in between, we're seeing lots of different kinds of responses to this COVID pandemic. And trauma in and of itself, you know, wh whether it's been severe or sort of what we think of as the kind of everyday trauma that the worried well, you know, many of us have to endure um, on a good day, we think about what are the things that destabilize us? What are the things that remind us that there are lots of things over which we do not have control? What are the things that prevent us from connecting with the resources that help us stabilize ourselves and re-regulate ourselves? And in this particular case with COVID, um, we have to surrender a lot of our autonomy individually as communities, medically and psychologically. We have to trust governments and resources and we have to lean into politics whether we agree with them or not we have to look at what's happening in the whole world and how different countries are dealing with it 
and deal with our own uncertainty, fears, doubts, anxieties, and whatever else was happening for us before all of it hit. So we're seeing a lot of, in particular, returns to heightened depressive symptoms and most certainly heightened anxiety symptoms. Um, and for many people, this if they weren't predisposed before to post-traumatic stress syndrome, we're really seeing that this is a global traumatic stressor of, of whatever sort for whatever kind of person individually, but also as a community and a society. So we're watching carefully for the symptoms of PTSD and depression. We're trying to accelerate our outreach as are many people all over in the mental health field. We're watching for not just the medical um, signs and signals, but more to the point, um, the psychological risk factors that put people in harm's way of needing higher levels of care or even being on very risky kinds of territory that would warrant um, a hospital admission or even uh, in a more emergency related uh, intervention. Well, you talk about, you use the key word here and I've been trying to figure out for, you know, not only my own family, but friends and employees and colleagues. Mm -hmm. Most of us, um, Dr. Marcelino, during life, when we describe trauma, it could, most of us think about a physical trauma that happens to us individually or a traumatic experience in our lives that involves the death of a loved one right. um, or our own physical um, well-being. Mm -hmm. This is something unique though, I think, to the, to the popular, to humans, to yeah. experience this kind of a trauma so quickly and it's mm -hmm. lasting so long. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you describe for us um, some of the more general things that a human goes through after a traumatic experience? Sure. Um, and I want to say, first of all, trauma is not only something physical to us. It can be something abrupt. It's unexpected. It's something over which we don't have control. And that can happen in individual life. It can happen as a witness to something that happens socially. It can happen as a survivor witnessing other people that have gone through trauma in a community way or a global way. So it has many different layers. Um, and there are several different kinds of um, sort of expected kinds of things that we would look for in traumatic responses. Um, people cognitively can get, um, their memory can uh, get foggy or even for some people at the more extreme, become absent in bits and pieces. People have a harder time paying attention and concentrating. They feel greater levels of mental fatigue. And I've had so many people over these last couple of months tell me, I don't know why I'm tired. I have all the time in the world now that I'm home to do these things, my list of to-dos, and, and I can't get my work done. And I don't know why I'm not motivated. So. A, a decrease in motivation, a sense of what's called anhedonia. You don't exactly know why you're not happy to think about the things that used to make you happy before. Um, people can get edgy and irritable. They can have difficulty sleeping or eating. They can have uh, flashbacks, in, in, and that's happening a lot now with this pandemic. People don't understand. In fact, I was talking to someone earlier today She's saying to me, I've, I've worked through trauma, the trauma, the sexual abuse in my life. Why am I having these nightmares? Why am I doing this all over again? Because what's getting triggered now are these out of control feelings, this pandemic everywhere you turn that's taking away what we thought of as ordinary, what's taking away our sense of security. It's taking away jobs and money and all the kinds of things that we thought we could count on. And, and Elizabeth, it's taking away our sense of control. Exactly. We are exactly. being told you cannot live your life as you did before. That's right. And what we're trying to sort through with people, though, is how do we, we suss out what we need to let go of and grieve, what we can 
hold on to, but we have to try to achieve in different ways than we, we thought we could in the past. And what we can look forward to and hope in, and in, to my way of thinking, um, we can do all the you know, cognitive behavioral therapies. We have tons and tons of interventions. But if we don't have something that we're living for, a person, a reason, a why, then it makes a lot of people feel aimless and like this is unending and there's no, there's nothing to hold on to. And that's when people start feeling tremendous amounts of despair and anxiety. And let's describe, describe for folks who are going to be watching this, how <laughs> the isolation plays into all of this. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things we know as, as human beings who are inherently social creatures is that we need connection literally in order to live in our early lives and certainly emotionally and spiritually. We, we need relationships in order to flourish, whatever that means for every individual person. And before COVID, when, when we would work with more individual populations on trauma, we talk about support groups. We talk about who has similar experiences. We talk about teaching people uh, the importance of reaching out and asking for help. We talk about accessibility and how to make resources available. And in this particular COVID pandemic, all of those things in the course of two weeks, this world stopped. It just stopped as we knew it. And every resource, most every resource, absolutely stopped. And we had to work really hard and really quickly to help people understand, no, here's how we can get to you and you can get to us. But people are estranged from each other. We see each other on video monitors. We can't touch the people that we love. We can't sit and go to the regular places, restaurants, coffees, sit at a park, do the kinds of things that we would ordinarily tell people are exactly the kinds of things they should be doing to help themselves remember what's ordinary, what they can count on, what they have today, because those things were really taken away really quickly and are only ever so slightly coming back now. So we really had to modify things and people are suffering for it. They truly are. Does the isolation that most of us are feeling now, um, does that sense of isolation lead to a heightened sense of depression in humans? It can, right? And we all have different levels of resilience. Some people actually have said to me recently, you know what, I actually feel really comfortable at home and I feel more connection because more of the world knows how I live now and knows what my life is like. So I actually feel less depressed than I did, but a vast majority of people are feeling like I'm here. I don't even really know what day it is. One day goes into the next. There's nothing differentiating you know, who we are from you know, two days ago, from two days from now. And that is really a strain on people. And it does start to encourage a numbness. People shut down. Um, they, they don't know what to do or where to go to, to regulate and to feel like they can ground themselves in what's ordinary, and what we have to hope in. And can that sense of depression um, lead to physical warning signs within humans? You know what, it can. And for most of us, you know, with this sort of, and I would consider it kind of a collective shock, a collective trauma, a collective grief and loss because we're all having to let go of autonomy to some degree. We're having to let go of whatever we thought normal was to some degree. So all of us are going through that and grieving and having some kinds of feelings of sadness and letting go are actually normal responses to a situation like this. But for some of us, the extent of it, the intensity starts getting a little bit too hard to metabolize and, it, and people get entrenched in it. And those are the folks we have to be really careful of and do extra outreach for. And that's hard to do. Um, it's hard to reach people who don't have smartphones. It's hard to reach, you know, those sort of um, regular, ordinary kinds of social determinants of health start factoring in. And those are the people that tend to get pulled down faster and harder 
Um, they don't have a lot of friends. They don't, on a good day, they can't see their therapist, who for many people is their main point of contact. So those things can really start getting dangerous for people. And we have to be very careful to watch for those kinds of symptoms. We do a lot of suicidality inventories. We do a lot of, you know, depression kinds of scales. I ask people constantly, simple scale, one to 10, you know, one is you're the Buddha and 10 is you're going to jump out a window. Where are you? We got to start from there so we know where we're going. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I'm asking those questions about the general population. I know that you specialize in um, segments of the population who have existing conditions. They yeah. may have existing mental health conditions. And this type of global trauma or localized trauma tends to exacerbate that in certain people. So people who are in recovery from addiction, people exactly. who are in um, circumstances where they have required some type of outside therapy. Yes. What is it doing to that population at this point? I mean, not asking specific cases, but sure. you're sure. still practicing and, and hearing those folks. Lots and lots. So I work, you know, there are people, most of whom, um, people with whom I work that have many different kinds of multiple disorders. They have addictions, they have um, major depression, they have, they might have been in the middle of doing uh, trauma focused work and trauma recovery. In fact, they often are in groups and, and have really started making progress, which involves people um, being more open about their symptoms, more open and vulnerable. And then all of a sudden, you've got this kind of thing that says, you can't talk to people, you can't talk the same way, you're in shock, nothing's normal, and you don't have access to those same kinds of things that, that help you. So you're drinking more, or you're out looking for heroin more, or you're obsessing. You know, I talked with a client earlier today who is so afraid of what could happen based on her past trauma that she's literally spending hours and hours Googling because she has nothing else to do at home, wondering about what's the possible one side effect that could happen for 0.00% of the population, and I'm sure I'm going to get it. And, and there's, so those, I'm sorry, yeah. there's the crossover. The crossover yeah. is there are a lot of people who don't have that heightened mental health issue that are now obsessing over the television yeah. and the news reports and yeah. thinking that, and they are fearful. Yes. They're living in fear of contracting COVID. How, how, exactly does, right. how do we handle that? The, those of us who are told this thing is out there, it's lurking, it's waiting to find a host and it's gonna find you. That's right. Are those so irrational if, fears that we have? They're, they're not irrational, but they can, we have to be careful to balance them with everything is about balance and moderation, right? So great to be updated about COVID and, and about other things, but there are lots of people that have it like this 24 hours a day and they're getting sucked in and there's nothing else they see in their lives. There are people that have become so afraid of every sneeze and every other person that now we're starting to see people start bullying Asian people, start bullying people that aren't wearing masks, that are, are starting to somaticize things like any single symptom in their bodies where they would have said, ah, I'm getting a cold before. That's not the case now. Everybody's hyper scrutinizing every single part of themselves and other people for that matter. So all of those things you know, can, can take us down a rabbit hole and we've got to try as best we can to be aware of here's what's real, but here are the other things that are also true. Like today, right now, I'm well. Today, right now, I have friends. Today, right now, you know, and doing those mindfulness kinds of things and doing the outreach and support groups of people, talking with friends and family, reminding yourself who else you are reconnecting with faith communities, if that's something you do, doing the online 24-hour uh, recovery groups, because 
you got to live it one or two minutes at a time. You know, those are the sorts of things that are going to remind people who else they are, who they were before this, and who we're trying to help them get back to in some kind of way. So what we want is to help people focus as well over the things over which they have agency, as well as looking at the, all of the things over which we don't or temporarily don't. So we're, t we're touching on, you know, there are folks out there who have some pre-existing conditions yeah. whose help, the need that they're going to have, the help that they, they require to continue on their path of recovery or stability, they are a vulnerable population that I don't think that we've spoken enough about during the 10 weeks or 11 weeks of, of the heightened emergency. But there, are, there is also the future that's coming down the line. That's right. That this may heighten a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear for a very long time into the I future. Think right. I think that's right. How do we deal with that as someone who's not, someone who's not in a recovery program, somebody who's not under the care of a, a psychologist or a therapist or a psychiatrist? the rest of us are going to deal with this for a very, very long time. That's right. What are the guidelines that you would advise on how we reach out for help? Well, first of all, I think you just said it right there. You've got to reach out for help. And if there's someone in your, your network of, of friends or family that looks like they need help, that looks like they're withdrawing, that looks like they're a little more irritable than, than you know, for longer than you're used to them being. It's, it's saying, hey, I'm concerned. So watching out for each other is huge. And also knowing yourself well enough to know that I'm not right. Um, I don't feel like myself. It's normal that this is going to take us time to integrate. We are most of us still in shock. We don't know what's ahead in terms of what the new normal is. And so we've got to be patient with ourselves around that, number one. We're not going to be the same that we were six months ago. And we have to be patient with that and compassionate with that in ourselves and each other. However, if we're having trouble functioning, if we're not able to do work the way we used to be able to do work, if the kids are bothering us more than kids normally do, if we're not tending to reach out to other people, we need support to say, hey, it's time. You've got to reach out to a support group and we have them all over, everywhere these days, online. Support groups, trauma groups, telemedicine, um, tr you know, specific uh, outpatient addictions or things that are offered like in the room, 24 hours a day for online for addicts and Alan, all those sort of things are, are mobilizing to make sure that people can get to them or hopefully know someone who has the technology that can help them get to that sort of thing. So it's a combination of being patient and not running, you know, aghast at every single thing and being afraid and giving ourselves time to adjust, but also saying how much how much and for how long do I feel not myself and when is it time? It's going to be a Herculean task, I think, because I have a lot of, um, you know, younger parents with kids and those kids have been home for 11 weeks now. Right. And I hear the exasperation in their voice. That's right. um, and, and I'm not, I'm not specifically saying it happens in this neighborhood. My neighbors will kill me if they hear me saying that, but one of the things that I've been noticing is the um, domestic violence is That's on the right. increase. It is. What do we do as somebody who is a casual observer if we hear something these days that just doesn't sound right in our neighborhood? You know what? If, if you're hearing something and are legitimately concerned about that and feel like someone's safety may be at risk, I believe it is incumbent upon us to reach out to whoever the local authorities are and say, I'm not rushing to support that, you know, turn this person in, but I'm hearing something that I'm not comfortable with. And I know there's an escalation in domestic violence, which is true. Um, so 
those are, that's the only way, you know, we can take care of each other is to be able to reach out and, and run it by the authorities or run it by someone who is a mandated reporter and, and needs to sift through, okay, is this normal? Does it make sense? What can we do to help? Who can we contact that isn't going to rush in and take the kids away, but is going to help people learn how to parent, get the space they need to breathe, those sorts of things, which people do need. I do fear, as many do, that when people lose their jobs, which may be coming down the line even more than it is now, when people are, are struggling more than they are now to pay their bills, and you know they start to look at each other differently, the smallest little irritation can send someone, when that wasn't the case before, quite the same way. You know, those are things that mental health professionals are starting to forecast for, for sure, and try to build in those sort of DV and trauma related responses for when the shock wears off and we're six months or a year down the road and we're still dealing with some of the acuity um, surrounding this kind of pandemic and the change that it's enlisted. I, I want to get to a couple of other things about how we should be being kind to ourselves moving mm -hmm. forward. Um, but I do want to just put a little bit of lightness, lightheartedness into our discussion. Um, but those of us who are in the media, we're used yeah. to soundproof boots and we're used to earphones and, yeah. and recording sessions. And sometimes we're used to being by ourselves and we're used to the technology that we're using. Yeah. So uh, the, the humorous incident last week was once the weather turned great, in my neighborhood, all of us who are working from home immediately went out into our gardens and sitting at our tables or on our porches. And then all of a sudden we all realized that we all had our laptops going at the same time. We could overhear the conversations that were taking place. None of us are in soundproof booths or conference rooms anymore. And I thought, Joe, you can't get irritated at that. Everyone is doing the same thing that you're doing. That's right. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of that. And I have been mortified myself, to be honest. I'm supposed to be doing, you know, these incredibly sensitive, deep and intense therapy sessions, which I'm doing on a laptop and my cat's walking across the keyboard or my dog is barking at every squirrel that's running down the street. And I cannot tell you how many times I've just had to say to someone, I'm so sorry, I'm trying to find a room in the house here or somewhere out on the deck or wherever where I can get two seconds of space with the earplugs and making sure the screen is turned and I'm not mentioning names. And, you know, it's just, it's crazy. But, you know, we're all reaching for something just to get back to normal. But I did notice you provided some normalcy for us tonight. You're outside, obviously, and during the first part of this conversation, you had a beautiful bird singing in the background for I us. That's right. I thank do, you. Thank I you did. for the ambient noise out there. Isn't that wonderful? Let's, let's go to some of the things that we can do for ourselves in a very, um, uh, not, it's not a heavy lift yep. for us to try to take a pause from all of this. This is Memorial Day weekend coming up. Um, I know the staff at the Media Center has told me, Joe, don't book anything for Friday because we're not working. So all four days, everyone, and I've been encouraging all the guests that have been coming on the shows, this is the weekend that you have to allow yourself to be good to yourself. Just Absolutely. take a break. So other than taking a pause, what are some of the other things that we can do going we forward? Need to, we need to laugh. We need to remember about sleep which most of us are forgetting about. We need to remember that it's okay to, you know, um, have a picnic out in the yard. It's okay to maybe, um, with a little bit of more caution than we normally would have done, uh, take a trip and see a relative that we haven't seen in a while, check on them and say hello and laugh again. Sit by a fire or whatever people are able to do um, to laugh and that's one of the things I make sure and do with people in almost every session as well because humor does heal and it's not to make light of anybody's suffering but if we don't have a balance and we don't remember what else life can be 
we can lose ourselves in each other, in my opinion. Yeah. But I think this is, you know, it's appropriate that the warmer weather is coming, yeah. that we are outside, those of Absolutely. us who have the luxury of having, you know, a yeah. little bit of space around us, um, right. apartment dwellers and condo dwellers, people who don't have their own piece of paradise, when they go out into public, are you seeing that people are much more cautious in interacting with each other? I mean, I know we can't see that we're smiling behind the masks these days, but. Right, I actually see, I see a lot of, a lot of different things. I see people that are so happy to walk by each other with masks and to wave because we can't see the smiles any longer. But the connection, the being in six feet proximity from someone who's also walking just to be in the sun makes all the difference. Sitting on a rock, not even necessarily near people, but listening to the birds like you can hear. And I listen to the kids on the street out riding their bicycles together with their masks on. They're having a ball. That brings me joy and those sort of things help. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing that our hearing is much more acute these days too. Yeah. We're listening to things that we haven't heard in a long time. One thing I will not miss when they come back is the airplanes overhead. Exactly. I, I think that silence at night is so therapeutic, at least it's, for me. It's beautiful and everything matters more. It really does. The ordinary things matter more. Our um, health I, matters more. Our yeah. health matters more. Our families matter more. Yeah. Our jobs yeah. matter more. I mean, all of that stuff right. is front and center. Dr. Elizabeth Marcelino, I want to thank you. This has been extremely enlightening to know yeah. that um, none of us are alone in this. And, and all of us are going to have to reach out at the warn and figure out those warning signs for ourselves. That's right. Yeah. And for each other. Absolutely. Right. Thank well, you so very much. Thank you. For uh, Somerville Media Center, my guest has been Dr. Elizabeth Marcelino from the Cambridge Health Alliance. As always, please stay safe, stay informed, have a terrific Memorial Day weekend. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Bye-bye right. now.